Coming up on this week's Book Guys show, we talk to veteran podcaster Mer Lafferty, author of the new Shambling Guide to New York City. And Professor Al and I talk about some podcasts we have coming up. Really exciting stuff. Stay tuned. Don't touch that dial. This is the Book Guys show. Guys show is brought to you by Audible. Go to bookguys.ca slash audible and get a free book just for signing up for a free trial. This is the Book Guys Show episode 82. Now, Professor Allen, I know that we're on 82 and episode 80 hasn't come out yet. What's up with that? <laughs> uh, it's that sort of thinking that got me drummed out of the accounting business. <laughs> Uh, we're just waiting for an interview, interview with Nick Briggs uh, to put into our Doctor Who special. Folks, that's why we've been waiting. Uh, we are going to be releasing that next week. We're going to talk to Nick Briggs, the voice of the Daleks. Uh, we're going to talk about all things Doctor Who in episode 80, all of the Doctors. Just putting it out there. My name is Paul Alves, of course. This is the Book Guys show. How's Professor Allen this week? Uh, great. It's summer. And even though I'm teaching one summer school class... At an accelerated pace, that's still a lot lesser workload than the rest of the year. So I'm doing all right. We've got a wonderful guest. Well, we've talked about her stuff on the podcast a couple times before. Mer Lafferty. How are you, Mer? I'm good. How are you guys? Very well. Welcome to the show. And Mer, as we always do, we're going to start off with the week's book news. For all those book aficionados out there, and it goes something like this. Book news. China approves Penguin Random House merger. Penguin Group and Random House confirm that China's antitrust authority has cleared the planned merger of Penguin Group and Random House without conditions. China was the final international approval needed for the deal to go through, so Bertelsmann and Pearson plan on competing, completing the merger next month, July 2013. Huge merger. It's going to be a you know, juggernaut. National Bookstore Day is planned starting in 2015. A proposal by Northern California booksellers to create a National Bookstore Day received a positive reception at Book Expo America. That's a huge expo, by the way. Executives of the booksellers group reported meeting with several publishing houses and received many pledges of support. A pilot bookstore day is planned for early next year with the goal of making it a national event by 2015. And maybe next year, uh, Professor Allen, on Bookstore Day, uh, I'll I'll go uh, mobile and we'll go live from a bookstore here and maybe... We can coordinate that we could all go mobile from a bookstore. I yeah. like the confidence that by 2015, there'll still be bookstores. Yes, very confident. <laughs> and, you know, us all coming live on Skype from bookstores is going to be a technical nightmare. It'll be fun. <laughs> and we're going to move on to... Books on film and television. Ice and fire readers gloat over TV viewers' shock and outrage. <laughs> Dramatic and shocking things happened in episode 9 of this season of Game of Thrones, which aired three days ago as of this recording. No spoilers. Viewers took <laughs> to social media to express their anger, despair, and shock. For fans of the original books, Sunday was an occasion to gloat, however sympathetically. As one Twitter user noted, Remember when your really nerdy book friend was super sad 13 years ago? This was why. <laughs> I gotta say, Professor Allen, you guys know that I... Stopped reading after book one because I really enjoyed the HBO series. It's so well done, so well scripted. Uh, and I got to say, last Sunday, I was like, oh, no, not, no. I, I'm in that, uh, in that camp anyways. <laughs> Some of us knew what was coming. <laughs> hey, speaking of someone knowing what was coming. Comic books, comic books, comic books. Although it didn't make it to air, at some point last week, last Wednesday's show, I was discussing with Padre... Uh, an idea that just popped into my head. I said, you know what would be great? A digital e-comic that was kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure 
where you could take certain paths and you know they could base the 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 background audio and the and just the visuals based on your choices guess what happened two days ago dc announces choose your own adventure e-comics i think they were watching and i should have patented it the dc squared multiverse technology actually allows the reader to go down a specific path of their own choosing so for instance in the image way up to the top which we'll put on the screen for all our viewers the reader is presented with two different paths one following the joker and one following harley which one do you choose whatever your heart tells you you could however end up choosing the wrong path but you're then taken back to start over sounds like fun yeah so you don't have to flip back and forth it just i like that love it annual superman celebration this weekend in metropolis Metropolis, Illinois, is hosting its 35th wah, wah. Superman cel- <laughs> hosting its 35th Superman celebration this weekend, June 6th through the 9th. The combination of this being the big man's 75th birthday and with a big budget movie just a week away, organizers are expecting one of their largest crowds ever. I've actually spoken to uh, other Superman fans. I mean, I'm tattooed, proven, hardcore. But they've gone to, to Illinois for that, and they have a great time. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a really small town. You've got to book in advance any bed and breakfast. But they tell me that if you're into Superman memorabilia, there's, first oh, of all, yeah. there's a great museum there just if you want to look at it, the stuff. But they have so much stuff for sale there. All of the collectors go there. And if you want to get some rare Superman stuff for your home, it's the place to go. Moving on. The Walking Dead comic plans to release Spanish language version. Ole! Spanish-speaking fans of the Walking Dead comic book series will soon be able to enjoy it in their language. The editors of the series announced late last week that they will print collected graphic novels this September in Spanish. We're excited to bring The Walking Dead to the Spanish-speaking market in the United States, said Skybound's director of business development, Sean Kirkham. Our hope is that The Walking Dead in Spanish will help develop a new fan base in this emerging market for comic books. Not bad. I, you know what? I'm surprised that a lot of the uh, e-comics aren't already automatically translated, that they don't have a, a way that the text could be swapped in and out. Yeah, just putting it out there. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, your cable TV can do it with one button. That's right. You know, you can switch the languages over. I'm going to take some time out. That's the news, folks. If I had a pencil, I'd throw it behind me. That's uh, slow book news week. Just saying. Talk about our sponsor, Audible.com. Mer, uh, do you uh, listen on Audible.com at all? I do. I'm a subscriber. Yes. I'm glad. Last week I put Sir Jimmy on the spot and he, he wasn't. <laughs> uh, what do you listen on, by the way? Um, what do I listen on? Yeah, Any which device? device? Uh, I have an iPhone. Brilliant. That's what I listen on my iPhone for years and years. Uh, Audible is just a great way to get an extra book a week, uh, whether it's in your car on your iPhone while you're doing the dishes. I keep saying the same things, doing the laundry. You know, laundry's boring, but not if you're in an office full of zombies and they're fighting over who has, you know, put the brain in the coffee pot. Just, just putting it out there. It makes all your household chores a lot of fun. All you gotta do is go to audibletrial.com slash bookice and you can get a free trial, a free book. And even if you quit after, you know, before the first month's over, you can keep the book. But I guarantee you, I've been a listener for years and years and years, you'll love it. And you can probably find some immersed stuff on there, I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. Uh, before we take a quick break, you know what? Let's talk about what we're reading. Professor Allen, what's on your plate this week? As I talked about you know, last week, I am in the middle of an embarrassingly large number of books, but that didn't stop me from picking up a new one. This one's not exactly a narrative uh, book, so I think, I think I'm okay, but this was the... The big, uh, the big book in the family this week was the Christine Ha Recipes for My Home Kitchen nice. cookbook. She won the U.S. Master Chef competition uh, last year and is a blind chef. Now, so now our, there our, you our, go. Our viewers and listeners know that I, I love cooking, so Jimmy loves cooking. But be honest with us, Professor Allen. Is that you cooking out of the book there or is it your wife? It's mostly me. Okay. And the missus and the daughter. So nice. we are we, we are sharing the load in this modern American family. It's the twenty first century, Paul. Of course, of course. I just want to see if you were with us. You know, we might do a cooking show one day. Just putting it out there for the folks at home. <laughs> I mean the rule is whoever cooks 
doesn't have to do the dishes. So yeah. seems to be a pretty fair trade. That is a great trade. I'm actually, this is called paper. It's called a book for those of you, uh, you know, under the age of uh, 20. Uh, I'm reading Fingerless by Ian Donald Arbuckle. I have to read the name, Arbuckle. It's coming out on January 12th, and I'll talk about it in a week or two. Because, you know, I don't get that much sit down and read time, Professor Allen. That's why I love Audible. You know, I can get my two, three books out a week without having to actually now, find time to sit and, you know, the now, glass let of me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Paul. You own the business. So do you let yourself listen to audiobooks at work? You know what? I'm, I don't rule with an iron fist. If you want to have an audiobook on, go for it. And even myself, sometimes if I'm doing, uh, look at you, I love that. There you go. That's what uh, Professor Allen's been listening to. <laughs> a, f a, f a few chapters in to Shambling Guide to New York City by Mer Lafferty. <laughs> well, I heard it's good. I, I heard it's pretty good too. And Mer, do so you have far. anything on, on your uh, pleasure reading list? Or are you just busy pleasure podcasting? Pleasure reading? Uh, well, I have a stack of books that I bought because I was excited about them, but I'm still working on my MFA, which means I'm doing a lot of book reading for school. And I just finished um, Peter Straub's the, A Dark Matter and Ian McEwan's Atonement. And, uh, yeah, now I'm listening to Lolita. Interesting. That's some beautiful writing about a very sick thing. Yes. Um <laughs> Really looking forward to finishing my reading so I can break into Lauren Bucas's The Shining Girls. I've had Cameron Hurley's books on the back burner for a while. I've got uh, the new Chuck Wendig, the new Mary Haskell. Um, I'm looking down because they're on the floor here. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I got a lot of books I can't wait to jump into. And I bought, I did buy some Audible books uh, for fun. Uh, Nelsferatu by uh, Joe Hill and Lives of Tao by Wesley Chu. You know, we, we have a term for that. It's called Book Mountain. It's that mm -hmm. mount, mountain of books that you, you, you're going to read. I'm going to read it next week. Yep. For sure, for sure. I have to interrupt here as a university professor and say, you're saying your textbook, your required reading is not pleasurable? Is that, is, is, <laughs> yes. is that what I'm getting from this? Um, oh, yeah. That's, How that's many sci-fi fans do you know pick up Ian McEwen just for fun? <laughs> I know I didn't. <laughs> And with that, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to play, not only are we going to play the theme song from The Takeover, which I believe Mer Lafferty had something to do with, uh, with bit. his permission, YouTube, with Jonathan Colton's permission, putting that out there, <laughs> which of course is uh, Colton's Regarding Your Brains video. And we'll also play the trailer from Mer Lafferty's new book, which we'll talk about right after the break. So don't touch that screen. We'll be back. We're going to talk about podcasts and Mer Lafferty. Coming up next. Well, it's eight o'clock and it's still light. A lot of good the extra daylight does us. Now, we've still got a three-hour drive back. We're not going to be home until after midnight. Well, if it really bugged you, Johnny, you wouldn't do yeah. it. You think I want to blow Sunday on a scene like this? You know, I figure we're either going to have to move Mother out here... <laughs> New York City, home to the Yankees, Broadway musicals, mile-high pastrami sandwiches, and a few hundred thousand monsters. Yeah, you heard me right. Vampires, zombies, demons, ancient death goddesses, you know the type. They're everywhere. Don't believe me? Well, I don't blame you. I didn't believe it either, until one of them gave me a job. I know, I know. Why in the world would you choose to work for people who would just as soon kill you as to take you out to lunch? You know what? Times are tough. And the pay was good. I mean, sure, you have to deal with the odd hours, the brains in the fridge, and the constant fear of being eaten alive and transformed into a mindless, shambling hell beast. Don't get me wrong, there, there are downsides to working for the undead. But hey, it's a living. 
The Shambling Guide to New York City. Available wherever books are sold. How cool was that? Love that Colton song. Lo love love Lafferty's uh, uh, podcast that came from that or, or used that as a theme song. Uh, love the trailer for your book, by the way. Very well put together. First of all, one of my pet peeves with most of the book trailers on YouTube is that they're all visual. So you can't you know play them on an audio show or right. listen to them. Yours really made sense. By the way, I want to apologize to our listeners uh, of the audio version last week. I left the emergency broadcast system teaser in the audio version, and a lot of you must have started up the book guys and wondering, what's all this noise? <laughs> so I apologize. I'll try to be more like Murr and make a better trailer that makes sense, you know, audibly as well. Uh, so we're going to talk with Murr about her book. Professor Allen, tell us, tell us a little bit about this book that you've, you've been reading it so far. The, uh, the Shambling Guide to New York City, which is, it's a uh, story of a young woman who gets the chance to write travel books, write a travel book for the, um, the undead and their monstrous friends. And uh, at the end of each, at the end of each chapter, Murr does a nice little, little uh, 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 segment from that, from that book. So you do get the, uh, you get the narrative story, and you get a little bit of the, the book within a book too. Now, now Murr, as soon as I saw the trailer, uh, uh, I didn't. First of all, I didn't know that you were publishing a physical book. Mm -hmm. So that's now on my. It's going to go on the top of Book Mountain, not at the bottom, the, the top of Book Mountain. And uh, I, I hear that you're also podcasting this one as well? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, very lucky enough to uh, Orbit allowed me to podcast the audiobook. Um, we started four weeks before the book came out so people could get excited about it. And uh, now it's available for sale via Audible. Or you can listen for free episodically. Uh, if you want to listen to the whole book, get it via Audible because it's going to come out just a chapter a week. Otherwise, uh, but yeah, I was I was Orbit knows how I built my audience, and so they right. wanted and I wanted to be able to to thank the people who helped me achieve what I've achieved so far, and that is my podcasting audience. And so I was able to uh, give them something a little bit in this book. See, uh, Professor Al and I were talking before the show. About that, we were wondering how do you approach your publisher and say, "Well, thank you for publishing my book. Can I also give it away for free?" <laughs> you know, how does that conversation even start? And you just well, described why. Right. Well, first they they knew who I was. I mean, they, we did a lot of talking about you know a, a lot of getting to know you stuff at cons before I signed the contract. And when I asked for uh, when it started the contract negotiation, I just figured you know why not ask for it? If they say no, they say no. And they said yes, so shocking. You know what, a very forward thinking of them. I know a lot of publishers who shall remain nameless that would never even dream of doing that. And that is very forward thinking and intelligent of them to know that this is your hardcore audience. These are the people that have been listening that uh, you know are gonna be the first ones in line to buy your book. And yeah. regardless of whether or not they can listen to it for free, they're probably still gonna go on Audible and, and you know put it in their wish list and, and get it. I mean, it's, it, it, I was gonna say, it, it, it seemed like a reasonable compromise. You're putting out a chapter a week. So in essence, before the book came out, you did a preview, you know, mm -hmm. a free preview, and then it sounds like you're going to do a chapter a week. So it's going to take a while to get to the end of the free exactly. version. And, it's not gonna, and it, and it sounds like it's not going to stay up there forever. So it sounds exactly. like you had a little, an, uh, I mean, it sounds like a pretty reasonable and fair compromise. And Mer, are, sure. you, are you narrating this one yourself? Yes, they, they really? actually uh, uh, had me go to a professional uh, sound recording booth nice. and wow. do the, the audio over four days, which I've never done before, <laughs> 80,000 words in four days. That was a little, little difficult. But yeah, it's quite a grueling schedule. It locked in. Yeah. I mean, how small? They're usually pretty small, right? Like, I'm claustrophobic. Yeah, yeah, so. it, was, it was closet <laughs> size. I didn't mind that. I minded, you know, being tired and not being able to eat yeah. lunch and all that. So. Wow. Audible.com. Remember, folks, you can search by author and by narrator, and no matter which way you search for Mer, Mer Lafferty, you'll find it. That's so right. The, the, so the, the version that's showing up in the podcast feed is, is this is the same Audible version. 
Yes, except I have right. end caps on it, right. and um, right. it's episodic. So they just sent me the to the the wave files via chapter, each chapter wave files, so um, I could put it together myself. No, no more. Is this one surprisingly forward thinking on really on on everyone's part there? Yeah. I think that's a like I said, I think that's a great compromise. No more. I have to ask. I really hope it pays off. Is this story? I've had, I've in had people tell me that um, they found my. They found the book via like John Scalzi's Big Idea or Scott Sigler's podcast, and then they came. They didn't know they'd be interested in it, but they came and they listened to the podcast, and then they bought the book. And so I've got at least two emails like that, which are very good. I, I have to ask: Is this in the same tone as the Takeover, or are we? Because I just the story sound a little like they could sync up. Uh, it's not the same technical world, but uh, yeah, it's the same tone. It's it's it, except. In the takeover, everybody knows that zombies and vampires exist, and in Shambling Guide, our human finds out that only a handful of people know that that <laughs> the monsters exist, and now she's one of them. I gotta tell you, I'd, I'd be putting it on my Audible list right now, uh, buying it with my credit, but I'm doing this podcast thing right now. <laughs> Save your bandwidth, Paul. <laughs> Priorities. Priorities is you, right. You mentioned Mur. You. you you mentioned getting to know these, you know, uh, publishers and, and contacts over conventions over years and years. And I've been a, I should be writing uh, a listener for uh, many years now. And you've you've had sort of a, a very steady progress in your career. You know, you've been yeah. at these you've been at these conventions as a podcaster, self-published author, now an award-nominated traditionally published novelist. Is there any difference? I don't know how you're treated, how you feel about yourself attending these events as sort of your role has uh, evolved over the years? I don't know. I don't know. I, it's, you know, I got to know a lot of authors via uh, interviewing them, which I did not, I didn't think I'm going to be networking, so I'm going to interview Neil Gaiman and I'm going to interview uh, Connie Willis. I just thought, wow, I want to interview these really cool people. And I didn't realize that would be you know, networking, and uh, I've told this story before on my show, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it was awesome because it was a uh, Reno Worldcon, and Lev Grossman had agreed to interv be interviewed by me, and he was so sweet and so humble, and he won the Campbell that night, and uh, but he said after we we talked, and then we did the interview, and then we talked a little bit more, and then he said. Uh, so are you you going to, well, I see you at any of the parties tonight. And I said, well, you know, the Hugo parties are invite only, and I'm not a nominee, so no. And he's like, well, I don't have a plus one, so do you want to be my plus one? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. And yeah. it was the Hugo cocktail party beforehand. I was standing in line, and there was a woman next to me, and we just started chatting, and we hit it off. We had the same weird sense of humor. We got our drinks, and then only then did we find out that I was a writer and she was an editor, and my book was already with Orbit, just with another editor. And then he quit, so she got the book. <laughs> so again, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't because I saw her in line, but right. she already knew my personality and, and whether I would be somebody she'd like to work with. Um, but I don't think so. I, I don't think I'm treated differently because... Most of the people I talk to are, um, you know, a lot of science fiction writers are, are as you're calling it, forward thinking. They are aware of technology and they're aware of what's going on. And I ha I've had a lot of authors say, if they've been on my show, they've seen a bump in sales. Uh, Lou Anders from Pyre says every time he's on my show, the, the Pyre sales go up. And so that that's a good feeling. But I know that, that they know me either from talking to me directly or hearing about I should be writing and um, you know and then some established authors listen which just blows my mind but uh, James Patrick that's how I met James Patrick Kelly and he's introduced me around and uh, so so it's a I've just been networking where I could and I didn't even know it I'm not saying I'm right. like some right uh, uh, what's the there was no evil master okay. plan, right? It was just exactly, exactly. <laughs> it wasn't an evil mastermind plan, but I did manage to. I go to cons, I interview people, I get to know people. Uh, I did Viable Paradise in 2006, which is a week-long writing uh, workshop for science fiction writers. And the people who do that are uh, the instructors were James Patrick Kelly, 
and Cory Doctorow and Patrick and Teresa Nielsen Hayden from Tor and Stephen Gould who wrote Jumper and uh, a couple other authors and no, you know, I was with them for a week so they know me now and last year somebody was blogging about how um, I was getting a no vote on the Hugo ballot from them because of some weird reason or another and I was I was feeling very bad when I read that blog post and then I saw the first comment was from Patrick Nielsen Hayden defending me and I'm like wow that's that's pretty awesome we, we were talking last so, week more about uh, uh, promoting your work and how a lot of authors now think that they can do everything by Skype and uh, the Padre was mentioning how important it still is to press the flesh as he calls it to, to get out there and there you go look at you serendipity all over the place Meeting, yeah. all, meeting all these people and, you know, network, networking with them without an evil master plan to begin with. But <laughs> it turns out, you know, you end up talking to Connie Willis. I believe the same Connie who did Blackout and All Clear. And you end up talking to Neil Gaiman and all these great people that can, of course, help you along the way. And I've said it time and time again, maybe not on the show, but uh, the most successful people I've ever met in my life are the most friendly and helpful people that I, I've ever met. Uh, people always think that, oh... This, this guy or this lady is successful, they must be a prick. It's usually, I find it's the polar opposite, where you, you finally meet these people, and you're like, wow, that, he's a great guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I actually, I got a really f funny backhanded compliment last year where someone said, the, someone else was, was, was putting me down for winning the Campbell by saying that the only reason I'd gotten, um, gotten nominated is because I'm so well-liked. And I'm like, I'm well-liked. <laughs> Hey! <laughs> that's so a, that was, that's, that was that, fun back then, compliment. Yeah, that was meant to be an insult, right? But hmm. <laughs> Yeah, well, I know. I'm just like, you know, hey, I'm liked. That's cool. Even but, my, uh, my day job yeah, here. Just, just for the record, you know, you said that I have, you know, there's all the serendipity stuff. that I've been doing this since 2004. So this has been right. eight and a half years of work, not yes. like. Bam, Bible, Bam, yeah. Bam, World It's not God, like you Bam bumped into deal. people at the supermarket. You were out there pressing the flesh, as we said. I'm sorry, maybe serendipity right. was the wrong choice of words. But no, no, I'm just, I mean, I'm just clarifying. You know what? Sometimes you can help serendipity along. I mean, <laughs> if you're not at the science fiction fair, you know, you're not going to meet, you know, Neil Gaiman. <laughs> exactly. So it's 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 been a lot of hard work, but it's been it's been fun, and I've gotten some. Uh, Got some opportunities where they say, you know, luck is not just luck; it's taking advantage of an opportunity when it shows up. And I've tried to do that. And uh, sometimes I make a mess of it, and sometimes I don't. So I just keep trying. So, Summer, is your uh, new book out now, or is it coming soon? Is it no, it came out uh, May twenty eighth, last a oh. uh, week ago. There you go. We'll, we'll put a, a link up on the screen, and uh, of course. Is Merverse your uh, your uh, website as well, or is it just your yep. universe? <laughs> no, Merverse. Merverse. That's my site. That's where you can get I Should Be Writing and my books and everything else. I'll, I will put that up on the screen as well. And uh, would you stick around? We'll talk about some podcasts. Sure. Because you're, you're quite the podcaster as well. <laughs> A little bit. Podcasts. Uh, Professor Allen, hang on. I know you want to talk about uh, the podcast you're doing with your daughter, but hang on, hang on. We have the very esteemed, award-winning, award-nominated, award-winning, the great Mer Lafferty is here herself. <laughs> Tell us a bit about your podcast. Uh, right now I'm doing uh, one podcast and one is on a uh, hiatus. Uh, I'm doing I Should Be Writing, which is, we started out being podcast for wannabe fiction writers by a wannabe fiction writer. And then when I got a uh, small press book deal in 2008, my listeners started complaining, saying that I wasn't a wannabe anymore, despite the fact that I still <laughs> totally felt like one. So now I just say four wannabe fiction writers, and I don't actually make myself known as some sort of expert. Um, and when I started the show, I wanted to talk about the, the, the emotions that new writers feel, because it's so easy to get your hopes and dreams absolutely crushed by a rejection or by a bad workshop or just by the fact that you can't finish a novel no matter how hard you try and and you know I'm there to say look when you're beginning something no one's good when they begin something and you just have to keep going and here's how you get through it and part of it is just 
me trying to tell myself that it's okay when I feel like utter crap as a writer. And if that helps anybody else, then that's good. And I've had a lot of people tell me that, you know, they didn't write for 10, 15 years until they started listening, and now they write regularly. And that's the best feeling in the world. But um, I also do the Angry Robot Books podcast. That's on hiatus, but we're going to be uh, starting that up again soon. Where I interview Angry Robot uh, authors, such as uh, Adam Christopher, Madeline Ashby, Chuck Wendig. Is that the same Angry Robot affiliated with Brilliance Audio? Yes. Love all those stories. Love them. Yeah, they, they put out some really good books. And I think what you were talking about, uh, it's all about perseverance. Keep at it. Uh, there was this young author who had, you know, he got his story rejected four times. And he got, he was so disappointed. He took the only printed copy he had. He threw it in the trash bin. His wife fished it out and submitted it without him knowing. And a couple months later, Stephen King published Carrie. So yep. keep at it. <laughs> Four rejections? Keep No, get 100 rejections. <laughs> I was going to say, Mark, why do you think I Should Be Writing has continued to really resonate over the years? You've done various other podcasts and, and, and your audio fiction and shows come and go and formats change, but um, why do you think, you know, what is it about I Should Be Writing that's made it last you know, 300 episodes later and still going strong? Um, well, one, I keep getting new listeners, and they keep asking the same questions. <laughs> um, because everybody has the questions. Yes. And the second thing is, uh, when being a writer, being a creative person, means fighting against entropy all the time. If you let your guard down, and by you I mean me, if you let your guard down, then you will spiral into despair and think that you are utter crap. And so, even if I've told people, rejections will not kill you, bad reviews will not kill you, if you write a book and it doesn't sell, write another book. Even though I've said that a hundred times, people need to hear it again. I need to hear it again. I need to hear myself saying it. I was just whining about, uh, to a friend about a bad review, and he's like, who is that that told me that bad reviews won't kill you? And I'm like, yeah, I know, but sometimes I need people to tell it to me. And uh, I actually have a, a friend of mine who's an established SF writer who's like, okay, if you need someone to tell you the stuff that you say to you, just let me know, and I'll call you, and I'll tell you all the things that you need to hear that you already tell other people. It, it's, it's an ongoing fight. I know so many established authors who think what they write is crap. I know so many established creative people who are afraid of the fraud police coming to their door to tell them that <laughs> they're going to take away their book contract or their awards or their New York Times bestseller status. Somebody who's thinking, someday all my listeners or readers are going to wake up and discover that I've been fooling them this whole time and they're all going to leave. Right. So it, it's we all feel that almost all the time. And so I just have to take care of that fear, hopefully using different words so I don't repeat myself too much, but uh, that's, that's what I try to address. I agree. I, th I think that's one of the strengths of the show is you talked about you know, sort of the emotional component that you bring to it. I think part of it's being vulnerable yourself and, and sharing your own career ups and downs and, and the, general oh, yeah. the general trajectory has been up, uh, but there have been some downs along the way uh, as sure. well and you haven't hesitated in in sharing those yeah I've only hesitated when um, when I have parted with agents in the past I've hesitated giving details right. because doing that publicly is just not cool but that's about that and like obviously contract details are about all I've held back it's like people people seem surprised if I talk about my depression or uh, my failures or whatever but it's like I'm trying to tell people that, look, what you're feeling, no matter how bad it is, you're not alone. There's so many writers who are depressed, and they think, oh, if I get help, then if I get, if I get medication, then it'll kill my creativity. No. I started writing for real two weeks after I got on my antidepressant, and I haven't stopped. I haven't stopped either, writing or the antidepressants. And I'm completely honest about that, because <laughs> if it saved me, it can save other people. And I'm not, I'm not an advocate for medication. I'm just an advocate for getting help. I just try to tell people, look, if you need help, go get it. Don't worry about yes. the stigma. 
uh, just go get help. And, you know, people seem surprised at that. And, um, you know, I talk about the downsides of the career without naming names or giving too many details because, you know, you don't want to do that. But um, just letting people know that their stumbles are not unique. You know, uh, and I applaud you for that as someone who also suffers from uh, depression, bouts of depression. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you cut open your arm, especially as a guy, you show it, look at this, everybody. Oh, man, it hurts. Look at the staples I got and stitches. But, you know, people are ashamed to say, well, some days I wake up and I don't want to get out of bed because I'm so depressed. They're ashamed yeah. to say that because it's, you know, a mental illness. We're all mentally ill, folks. We're all, <laughs> that's the way I look at it. We've all got some quirk up there. I certainly have quite a few. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> We're all but mad here. But, but, you know, but it's great to get out there and, 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 and through your podcast, you know, you're, you give us some you know, personal insight into your life. And you know, like you said, you've got a problem, address it. And a lot of people don't address uh, any kind of uh, emotional or you know, depression. They don't treat it. It goes untreated. Or they treat it with alcohol or, dr- or not like prescribed drugs. You know, they treat it with other you know, things that are more of a detriment to their life and make life worse but you got out and you got uh, the proper treatment it worked for you and it's it's great that you're out there and i applaud you for for doing that it's great also love the podcast i think all of our writer listeners if they have time for one more podcast i'm not saying stop listening to the book guys show or, or watching just saying if you have time for one more it is a great podcast we'll put a link up on the screen as well i was gonna say one of the things that you know the show uh, you know, Mur tends to have a very, like, a very encouraging uh, feel to her, in that, um, you know, so almost became sort of an, an an inside joke when you would do your shows with Matt Wallace, the good <laughs> cop, bad cop. You were sort of playing on the, I'm, I'm the encourager, but you, there, there's also this other side that you might need as well. Seriously, I, I, it's it's right. Well, I think that there are. The problem with being encouraging and and talking people through their uh, problems is sometimes that could be a crutch. Sometimes that could be a little blanket. It's like, I don't want to get out of bed. Well, you don't have to get out of bed, honey. Let me tuck your blanket around you. And that could be a problem. Sometimes you need someone to say, look, I don't care if you're going to be a writer. It's all on you. You could be a writer or you could not be a writer. I don't care. And that's what Matt's for. And the good cop, bad cop is 100% opt-in. I do not embarrass any of my listeners. They know what they're getting into right. when they send an email to good cop, bad cop. And, um, you know, I, people like it. I thought, God, if somebody talked to me like Matt does, I would probably fall over crying. But they love it. And sometimes they need to hear it because he does give good advice. Matt does not like new writers because a lot of them are they, they're the ones who talk about writing without actually writing or they're too, they're, they think that they're so perfect they're going to self-publish because they can't take the rejection of actually trying to get it published professionally or traditionally or whatever you want to call it. They've got to piss somebody off by saying that. And um, So yeah, Matt's, Matt's approach is, is different and sometimes people need it. So uh, I do know that, you know, the, the all, always petting the bunny approach may not help some people. It may just tell people, oh, it's okay if I don't write today. Right. So yeah. Matt's, Matt's my, my dark half. <laughs> now, in, in, the last, in the last year or so, you've been keeping us updated on the uh, or last, maybe just this, this calendar year, keeping us updated on your writing with what seems to be a pretty amazing tool, the magic spreadsheet. The magic I know you, spreadsheet. I know you didn't come up with it, but tell us <laughs> no. just a, a little bit about that and how it's helped you yeah, and please. as an encouragement to writers. Yes, I, we were joking at Balticon about how it's become a cult. I mean, have, I, have you learned about the glory of the magic spreadsheet? Um, now, it's, it's my friend Tony, who's also in the same MFA program that I am. He, he does he knows how to use spreadsheets. I never learned spreadsheets. They're magic to me. I just don't even understand. And so, you know, he tells me all the things you can do with spreadsheets. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And so he, he, he had done one for, uh, he was trying to do like the paleo diet or something with CrossFit. So he was trying to give himself po- bonus points every time he hit his daily nutrition goals or something. And then he thought, well, I could do that with writing. And so the goal is consistency. It's not word count. 
The goal is to get you into a habit writing every day. I've been writing professionally since around 2002 or three, and I've never written every day. And uh, for some reason, Tony gave me the spreadsheet. He says, you just put in your daily word count. If you write one day, you get a point. And then you get a couple of points for as many words as you've written. But that doesn't really matter eventually because you write two days, then you get two points. Nice. Today, I got 184 points. Nice. I've been writing for 184 days straight because every time I think I don't want to write today, I remember that I'll break my chain. And I'm like, I'm the one in the lead. And I know if I break my chain, I've got over 100 people who are going to give me all sorts of crap for it. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a lot of words. It's still not a lot of words. right? It, Tony even put a little bit of a gamification into it where once you hit a certain number of words you, or points, you level up. Oh, and nice. so you can get more <laughs> points, but you, can, you also have the problem of um, you, your daily word count is higher. So you start out with 250, 250 words, which is nothing. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I, and I don't want to jinx you. Like I jinxed myself last week when I said I should patent, you know, choose your own adventure comics, but iOS app, just putting it out there, Android app. This sounds like something I, you got to sit down with an app maker. Yeah, no, I, I, I've t I, I'm sure Tony's thought about it. Uh, I'm going to see him again in July, and we're going to talk about the magic spreadsheet. I'm going to put him on the show again. Um, but I, I think it's helped. It's helped a lot of other people. Somebody told me. Somebody else told me of Altakai that uh, it it got her writing partner out of his own depression because you know he he wouldn't write anything and now he's finished like a novella or something. And uh, it's it's just to develop a habit. And I've never had a habit, which is why I'm so almost cultish about this because I've never been able to write every day until now. And it's yeah. almost like. It's it's almost like the alcoholic holding onto their chip. Right. I'm like, I have my, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to day 200. It's coming. It's coming in less than <laughs> well, a month. I'm so excited. Well, first of all, so, happy uh, six month anniversary. That's right. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> now, and, a lot of uh, people look at uh, it, it, systems like this and think, well, that's not going to help me. And then, you know, and I, I was one of those people thinking, oh, you know, you know, Anthony Robbins, personal power and writing a spreadsheet. This that's not going to work. And then I got my Samsung S4. And it's got this little health tracky thingy. Mm -hmm. So I'm tracking my calories, how many steps I've taken, all the exercise I've done. I've lost like eight pounds in two weeks. Wow. Just by, you know, shaming myself. I'm looking at it and I've got, I can do another 700 calories today in food, but I'm going to try not to. Because I, I, when you look at the graph, it's like looking at the spreadsheet and how many points mm -hmm. you have for writing. It's that you're encouraging yourself through the, the spreadsheet or through the, the app that tracks it or whatever and it, it works yeah i can see how that would get someone writing yeah. every day and, and it doesn't work for some people but for other people it's 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 magic which is why i, I called it the ma tony made it but i'm the one who named it the magic spreadsheet because I love the it feels too. like it's it's magic <laughs> to me and some people hear about it and they're like well what do you get for your points i'm like nothing you get you get bragging <laughs> rights and that's huge we have they they set up a leaderboard for um number of words written in a month, number of total words written, points, longest chain. And I don't, I'm not one who goes for the two, 3,000 word days. I just go for the chain. And so I have the longest chain and the most points, but I'm like 10th or 20th on the most number of words, depending on whether you're looking at the month or the year. And um, that's okay. Other people can gain that. So even if you don't have the longest chain, there are other things you can gain by getting, um, like throwing a lot of words on the paper. Now, now, Murray, in the app, when you uh, get achievements and points, <laughs> of course, you know your your book will be featured when the person starts up the app. Just putting it out <laughs> again, putting it out there, giving away that, million that dollars. That seems reasonable. I, I I have told Tony the same thing. I know he's 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 also working on his MFA, so he's he's got some other things going on. I don't want to push him too hard, so <laughs> we're gonna we, we've got like a list of things we need to talk about. In over the the course of the residency, so I hope we actually get work done. But uh, yeah, it's it's. I will mention it to him. I think I've texted him about it, and he didn't respond back. But I blame that on the fact that he's in Who's Hawaii and I'm North, North Carolina. <laughs> I don't know why that that fits, but it, it works in my head. Now I didn't know you were in North Carolina, or else we would have had you go over to see Sir Jimmy at the Free Hollow Book Bunker, and we could have done a two shot maybe next time. 
His wife's a good cook. I don't know cook. what you're talking about. His wife's a good cook. <laughs> one of, one of our co-hosts is in, Gre- is in Greensboro. Oh, okay. How far is that from you? It's an hour. Oh, okay. Not bad. That was good. Yeah. Back on, back on, on uh, out, out, out of podcasts, back on the books, um, the, uh, we've got Shambling Guide to New York City is out. And yes. from what I rem- what I remember from the podcast, there have been some trips to Louisiana. Is yes. that for what's what's on That's the horizon? That's for book two. That's for book two. There was um, I I did a whirlwind four day trip to New Orleans to just get a feel of the city that you can't get for via travel guides. And um, of course, I went in November, which is not really the best time of year at all to go but that's okay I still got a good sense of of what I what I needed I wasn't gonna go for the uh, stereotypical Bourbon Street drunk fest show your stuff kind of thing but um, but yeah I I have a friend who Ursula Vernon who won the Hugo last year for the best graphic story I gotta I gotta drop her name but uh, she's also a freelancer and she's local and I said so, want to go to New Orleans with me? <laughs> and she's like, sure. So we hopped in the car and drove 14 hours to New Orleans and Fantastic. stayed there three nights and uh, experienced as much as we could and then came back home. And then I wrote uh, Ghost Train to New Orleans, which is book two in the Shambling Guides series, and it will be out in March. Ooh, looking forward to that. Now, Mer- uh, yeah, again, it's m- Mer- merverse.com where folks can find all your stuff. Yes. It's, yes. been, it's been so much fun talking to you, Mur. Uh, we're going to take a, a little bit of a break. I want to say thank you so much. It's been a wonderful thank guest. Thank you. This was fun. Lo- love to have you back anytime. Even in October? Even in October, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a little wink there. Folks, okay. we'll, we'll tell you about that we'll later. See. But Mur will be back in October for sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, folks. We're going to talk some more podcasts and stuff don't touch that does it dial dial screen don't don't touch the screen be right back alert alert why are you behind discussion detective why are you humans discussing the anti-dialect propaganda television program i think i'm in trouble here answer answer uh we're 50th anniversary of the show. There's a television show on Earth about the Doctor. It's the 50th anniversary. Uh, where did you guys come from? This oh. is the 50th anniversary of the Daleks. It is of the Daleks. Do not ignore the Daleks. All humans who do not recognize the supreme authority of the Dalek race will be exterminated. Exterminated. I, I love our intro music. Thank you, Sir Jeff Smith. Sir Jeff Smith, of course, also part of our Doctor Who special, episode 80, which will be out soon. Very soon, I promise. He even, but Paul, isn't this episode 82? I know, I know. Is that going, a wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey scenario? Timey-wimey. It's all crazy. We, we need a TARDIS for all this. But uh, yeah, Jeff uh, did perform Fantastic Rose, his uh, Doctor Who themed song on the show, live for us. What a great guy. What a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you, Jeff Smith. TheJeffSmith.com. Check out his work. Go on iTunes. Folks, if you love the show, you love the theme song, go on iTunes right now. Type in Jeff Smith, G-E-O-F-F, Smith, and buy a song. Buy Gravity. What a great song. Buy the whole album. Uh, anyways, we're back. We are resuming podcasts. Now, I hear rumors, Professor Allen, that you're branching out. Are you abandoning the book, guys? I, I hear there's a, a new podcast or two or three coming from the Middleton household. Well, you know, we are, uh, uh, we are over here big fans of the podcasting medium. And I have been kicking around notions of a solo podcast for a few months now. Love the book, guys. Love being a part of the team. But if you guys can do your emergency broadcast system without me, 
I can go ahead. We can split up. I just like to think it's 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 like an X Files episode where Mulder and Scully split up because that always turns out well. Hey, listen, you're always welcome on emergency broadcast system. But let's talk about I, what you're doing. I, you, I, you're, I've listened to enough. I know I don't. I I, I I think I'd rather go. Solo. You you don't want to lose your job. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> State employee and all. Um, so, but it was about a week ago that my just graduated from college daughter said, you know, Dad, I'm thinking about starting a podcast. I thought, ooh, you know, I kind of was too. I love so it. Just it's been, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's podcast the next generation. <laughs> exactly. Now, there are, a couple of, uh, there are a couple of father and son comic book podcasts uh, out there. There's a, a, a Green Arrow podcast, the... Uh, uh, Emerald Archer, and uh, Hey Kids Comics to uh, a British father and son team. Uh, but what my daughter and I are thinking about doing is sort of maybe doing our own show, sort of separate shows on the same feed, and then maybe doing a, a joint show uh, as well. So as details uh, uh, become more solidified and, and firm, we'll talk about it more here on the Book Guys, and there may be a promo or two for you to play as well. Now, I assume you're going to start off like the Book Guys did, audio only? Audio only, and, and, and these are comic book-specific podcasts. Fantastic. Of course. Of course. And, of course, as you mentioned, Emergency Broadcast System, our third reboot. We're finally going to get it right. I think we're going to do it on Google Hangouts. Uh, it's going to be kind of like a morning zoo, only it happens in the evening, and we don't really have any corporate you know, uh, media conglomerate behind us, so we're kind of free to say what we want. And there's I'm a scared already. Two drink minimum. I'm going to say, folks, it, if you like the intelligent conversation you have here, don't watch Emergency Broadcast System. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing, thing is, I mean, uh, there is um, obviously a connection between our shows, other than obviously being, being a, a book guy's a, a host as well. But the, the, the other is my show is about comic books. Which get rebooted all the time, right? And your show <laughs> is a comic book in that it's getting rebooted all yes. the time. Yes, but this is the final. This is the one and only final reboot. Uh, it's gonna be myself, a guy you guys might know, Sir Jimmy, Craig Damlo, who's been a guest in the book guys as well before, and Bill Meeks from Meeks Mix Media, who is of course the fantastic artist who made our intro with the superheroes and all that, Absolutely. and he's putting together another fine intro for our. Mercy broadcast system. Basically, we're going to talk about the news every week. I mean, it's not a news show. We're going to bring you the strange news, the weird happenings. We're never going to bring you false stories. We're going to bring you um, interesting news stories and, and have some semi-intelligent discussion about it with a live studio audience, a lot of liquor, possibly drugs. Just warning you. <laughs> None of that will be on my show, interestingly enough. <laughs> And fresh out another note before we let our fine listeners and viewers go on about their daily lives. Uh, last week, as I was editing the show, and some of you who watched last week's show will notice that I was talking about our goal was to have more listeners than could fit in the Air Canada Center. Then I, I, I <laughs> just I paused the editing at that point. I said, "Let me take a look." And the week before, we did hit that. And you were telling me just today that one of our episodes also had like twenty-two thousand, which in no way on God Green's Earth. God's green earth would fit in the Air Canada Center. We did it! Yatta! <laughs> Where are we moving to next? If if we all stand in the CN Tower, will that work? I'm not sure exactly. I think, how I think that. we're gonna go um, just because I'm from Toronto and I'm in Toronto. I am Toronto. Uh, I think I'm gonna find out how many people fit in the Sky Dome, and that's gonna be our next goal. Perfect. I think it's. I around, like it. I like it. It's around a sixty thousand seat uh, stadium because they do play CFL there, which is like NFL, but more down or less downs. I don't know. I don't like football unless it's played with a foot. And it's called soccer. <laughs> uh, next week on the show, Pat Flewelling returns. Padre's taking a hiatus on the show. You know, he's just moving to Petaluma. He's uh, going to join full time as part of the Twit family and uh, basically living in the in the brick house. I'm told that uh, Leo has a cot for him in the basement. Whatever that means. <laughs> So, so he's going to be busy for a while. He will not be on the show for a while. But I've asked him to send us once in a while, once in a while, Professor Allen, Padre's picks. So oh, we're going to get like a that. video from the Padre, wherever he happens to be. Maybe he'll be in the Twit House. 
you know, maybe he'll be on the like Gizwiz set and he'll be able to give us a little pick of his every week. I'm hoping. Come on, Padre. Come on. We're four out though. Well, if he's taking a few shows off, we're going to have to bulk up the technology coverage ourselves. That's a scary prospect. What I tell you, Professor Allen, I got to change the timer on the lights. I, we, I always think we're never going to go past a certain time and the, all the blue lights went off on the timer. And when I see red on that screen there, I know it's time to <laughs> press the button. Let's do this. It's been a lot of fun, Mer Lafferty, Professor Allen. Next week, Sir Jimmy returns as well and, and Pat Floelli. And maybe a mystery guest. How does it go, Professor Allen? See you next week. Same book time. See you guys. Same book channel. <laughs> Stay tuned, book readers and book listeners. Book Guide Show will return next week. Same book time, same book channel. Look at all the tablets. Look. You crazy. This one plays jingles. This one is my... Ah. <laughs>